drama? Do you sing? Do you dance? Do you <laughs> Hello, everybody. I want to welcome you to the panel presentation, Health, Hope, and Hurricanes, Faith in the Katrina Aftermath. Is this working well? Can, am I speaking loud enough for this? Yes, you can pick it up. Okay. okay. <laughs> I'm Tian Parker Dominguez. I'm an assistant professor here, and I'm also the one of the faculty co-sponsors of the Christian Caucus, along with Rafael Angulo, sitting here in the blue. Uh, and we, along with the caucus, coordinated this panel presentation. We are doing a live feed to Orange County, and so that's why all the lights and all the equipment uh, that you see here. But I appreciate you all coming. I wanted to just introduce the reason why we decided to do this, some of the things we were hoping to get out of it. Uh, and our wonderful panelists that we have here today. Uh, I also wanted to announce that, unfortunately, the um, pastor at the Dream Center is unable to attend. He had a sudden death in his immediate family, and so he's attending to um, a personal crisis right now. And the resident that was going to accompany him, uh, we're assuming as well, since the pastor wasn't able to make it, isn't able to come either. But we are incredibly fortunate to have the panelists who are here. So, uh, and I'll introduce them to you in just a minute. Um, in thinking about this particular panel, what uh, I was struck by when all of this happened, and we had a few things that happened in the school right afterward, uh, where there was a lot of discussion in classes and, and a special sort of lunchtime thing we had where we viewed the Oprah special report and we had student feedback and talking about it. Uh, and one of the things that I was struck by um, was a focus on all of the, and rightly so, negative aspects of this disaster, how many people were, were affected, the incredible amounts of people that were displaced, uh, the fact that so many people were left there uh, suffering, the, just the devastation to people, to property, to an entire city, um, a, 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 really a culture. New Orleans has a very distinctive culture that's, that's been severely affected by all of this. And the, the effect across the country, I think all of us at some point, on some level, are going to be personally directly affected by um, what's happened, even if it ends up hitting us in the pocket because of the cost of having to rebuild that we're all going to um, uh, encounter. And also all of the talk around the negligence of the government and problems in what happened with FEMA, what happened with um, funding issues and political priorities for why levies weren't um, uh, you know, repaired and fixed. And, and just a lot of negative messages, negative issues, negative talk around the situation. So that was one issue. The other issue was the sense of well, it's today's news, but tomorrow we're all going to forget about it. It'll all kind of go by the wayside. Right now, we're all engaged in this, this situation because we're being bombarded by all of these media messages and images, uh, and it's something everybody's talking about. It's on the front page. What happens when it goes off the front page? Are we all going to forget? Is it all going to become yesterday's news? Is it not going to be as important anymore? And a lot of uh, things that were said is that the real work the real issues happen after the cameras have been turned off, when people are having to deal day in, day out with what's happening, when all of the major relief efforts that, that, in, that are immediately put in place, emergency efforts, uh, start to dwindle and be closed down, and people have to start getting on with it. Are we still going to be as concerned and as engaged and as active in what's going on when that happens? And so I thought, OK, we're a couple minutes out now. It's off the front page. Is this an issue that people are still concerned about? Are they still aware that there are people that still desperately need our support and our help? Um, and I also wanted to have a focus on positive aspects of this disaster. What are some of the good things that came out of it? How are people coping? Uh, how are people doing with this? How did people come together to uh, to kind of meet the need when the government wasn't there, when there was a lot of disorganization and kind of the, the formal federal services that were supposed to kind of step in and, and take care of people. 
Uh, so those were kind of some of the issues that motivated us to start thinking about doing this panel presentation. So today, what we wanted to focus on was a specific type of response uh, to Hurricane Katrina, which are faith-based responses. And in thinking about this, we wanted to look at faith-based responses both at a micro level and a macro level. So what were some of the uh, faith-based social service responses to uh, the hurricane? And what are some of the micro-level faith-based responses to the hurricane? How do people use spirituality, however they define it, however they think about it, uh, in coping with crisis uh, and a major sort of natural disaster crisis like this one was? How does that foster coping? How does it foster personal resilience in dealing with a, a situation of this magnitude? So those were some of the issues that we were hoping to uh, address in the panel today. Um, I wanted to present our panelists to you, introduce them to you, and then I'm going to show you uh, about a four-minute um, compilation of clips from the Oprah Winfrey special um, presentation on Hurricane Katrina that highlighted some of these faith-based sort of issues at a micro and macro level uh, that people were um, discussing and encountering. Okay. Oh, I can't move from the microphone. I'm standing in front of a person. Okay. Uh, the first panelist that we have with us is Gilda Taylor. She's the executive director of the Interfaith Hospitality Network Humboldt, Humboldt area in Houston. Um, and she also happens to be my mother. So. <laughs> and I decided she was coming for Thanksgiving. I decided I'm going to put you to work, Mom, on your vacation. So. Um, so she's going to be talking to the macro level issues uh, that she was directly involved with in uh, responding to Katrina in the Houston area. We also have with us our very own Judy Exonovitz, who is the director of the Skirball Campus uh, Social Work Program, who was a volunteer, uh, went down to volunteer in Houston at, uh, for Katrina relief, and she um, did a lot of work with faith-based organizations when she was down there, and she's going to speak more to the micro level uh, issues of, of spirituality and coping and resilience and clinical uh, practice. Right? Okay, so without further ado, I will show the clip, and this is just quickie clips kind of just all put together, not no fancy editing or anything like that, but just to give you a sense of some of the uh, issues we're going to be talking about. An Oprah special report. other family members alive. It's going to take time. Let's focus on rebuilding your life. If your children all day, you know, like it's a lot of I have to punish us like this, you know. It's been so hard. It's been so hard. Some of the stories are clear at Cornerstone Church here. There's evidently 130 displaced people. We met Lois, who felt happy and blessed to be alive, but had a hole in her heart because she had no idea what her family was. Much work to do. The one thing that is pure about helping out a tragedy like this is service. Share what you have. And that's the best way we can. And in a crisis like this, when you really, really have to count on your neighbor, you have nothing else to count on. I am. I am. <laughs> I'm just going to see the heart. Let's see. Can you see Amazing Grace? Yeah. Okay. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved us. 
moment in time we all kind of forgot where we were and we just sang together and praised together Has FEMA been here? No. No. We have yet to see them. The only FEMA we've seen are the search and rescue FEMA. Uh-huh. But the relief team, we've yet to see. Yes. And so nobody's brought in water or anything for you? Um, two days ago, some volunteers from a church in Alabama okay. came in. Um, yesterday, some people from Hattiesburg, Mississippi mm -hmm. started coming in yesterday evening. The National Guard guys shared their MREs with some of us. Mm -hmm which is awesome. Mm -hmm. and what you're planning to do is reunite some family members. No. Our church opened up and we have 23 people there and we're down here to pick up the rest of the family. Now, is this a family you're going to reunite? We, we believe so. We've oh, never met them. Oh, okay. We drove down here with so, one name. This is Shelly. These two women are driving you to be reunited with your other family members. We are so happy that you all came. Do you know what's going on? Thank you. We're going to get our bands. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And take them home with us. A lot. Okay, so with that, we'll go ahead and get started with our panelists. The first is Gilda Taylor, Executive Director of the Estates Hospitality Network in Humboldt. Is that good? That's good. Okay. Hi. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to give you a little picture of uh, homelessness before we had Katrina and before Rita hit. Um, in Louisiana, Texas, Mississippi, and Alabama, there were approximately over 6,200 homeless. Uh, nationwide, we had about 727,000 homeless, or one in 400 Americans was categorized as not having a home. Um, and that was in line with studies that had been done for a long time, and especially the study that was done in the year 2000 by the Urban Institute. Now, in the, that study, California came out number one with about 195,000 homeless. And Texas, where I'm from, was number four with a little more than 39,000 homeless. L.A. County was number one with about 88,000 homeless. And Houston, where I'm from, was number five. We had about a little over 14,000 homeless. Now, that was before the disaster. And after Katrina and Rita hit the Gulf Coast, uh, homelessness rates went up a hundredfold, and the national rates doubled. Louisiana and Mississippi alone had between 400 and 600,000 displaced households. Homelessness now after the hurricanes is a very prominent issue. And you're looking at a lot of different aspects of homelessness that we weren't looking at before. And people that are in the business of helping with homelessness are hoping that this is going to create new policies and new funding that are going to impact homelessness in general and not just the people that were evacuated or displaced by the hurricanes. Um, FEMA has promised more than $23 billion in housing. Promised, I say. And most of that money is going to rebuild homes. Ultimately, Katrina will add 3% to our nation's homeless population. But we also have seen a new face to homelessness. 
In the studies that were done before the hurricanes, you knew there were different populations within the homeless population. There were people living with family and friends. There were people that were what we considered marginally homeless. There were people that were on the streets. There were people that were in shelters. Well, now, after the hurricanes, we're also looking at people who lost everything suddenly and for a very long period of time. And that's a whole new category of homeless. There was a study done by the United Way of the Texas Gulf Coast, which is located in Houston, and it was called Open Doors. And they talked to a little over 5,000 families, which was, I have to say this, is only a small percentage of the people that were in Houston. But they did a survey, and they asked these people, uh, for one of the questions was, what was your primary residence before the hurricane? And approximately 10% said that they had been staying with family and friends, and 90% had had their own home or their own apartment. After the hurricane, this 50% were now staying with family and friends, 30% were living at motels and hotels, and the remaining 20% were in shelters or private homes or homeless. So you see there was quite a shift in reality for these people. Um, also, there was a group that were not even addressed in the issues surrounding this disaster. The people that evacuated got stuck on the highways, paid for gas, stayed in hotels and motels, and came back to their homes, which were still intact, and also had problems paying their bills, paying their utilities because of the money that they had spent in the emergency. And there was no funding for them. So this is another group that we have to consider that still need assistance and don't know what they're going to do. Um, in the aftermath of Katrina and Rita, there was a mixed community response. It was not just faith-based. And this is, to me, a picture of how we as faith-based organizations operate on a natural level. We are not um, in a certain section serving a certain section. We are in the serv social service arena, and we serve among non-faith-based organizations, secular organizations, as well as other faith-based organizations. Um, what I did was I asked the people that are in the Humble area, which is on the outskirts of Houston, um, what did they do? How did they respond? And so some of these answers were from <coughs> churches and organizations where I work in Humble, and some were from people and organizations in Houston. So it, this is a mix. Uh, so I had like 15 faith-based organizations and churches. I also want to mention that the two main homeless shelters in Houston are faith-based. One is the Salvation Army and one is Star of Hope. So the main outlets for serving homeless people are faith-based outlets. Uh, the school districts were also part of the, uh, the response. They absorbed over 20,000 children, and they paid for it. Seven school districts paid for all that. Uh, new study, new supplies, uh, redistricting everything, and they're still waiting for FEMA to reimburse them. Uh, Steinmark became a collection site. The general community uh, stepped up. There were over 36,000 people trained for uh, work at Operation Compassion, which was at our George R. Brown Convention Center. The city government stepped in. Our mayor took over uh, providing and seeing, oh, supervising what went on in Houston. So we had city government also involved. Uh, in Kingwood, which is a suburb where I'm located in Humble, 
uh, the Chamber of Commerce got involved. And the Chamber of Commerce, as you know, is businesses. While there are nonprofits that are part of the chamber, we are part of the chamber. And the chamber stood up and set up a website to organize the volunteers and to direct the survivors to local places where they could go get assistance. Uh, the Houston Food Bank uh, was a part of the recovery efforts. Uh, Grace Community Church set up a medical clinic and they got local pharmacies like Walgreens and CVS to give one month of free prescriptions uh, local doctors and nurses do dedicated time and also gave sample medications for people. Uh, pharmaceutical companies donated sample medications and local hospitals provided diagnostic tests for free. Uh, Baptist Church in Spring told me that they worked with two non-faith based groups to provide services in that area. And also in Humble, the Civic Center was opened as a makeshift emergency site. It was not there to supply needs. Uh, they only provided a place for people to be out of the storm or when the storm hit. Um, now, the types of assistance that were given by all these different people included clothing, food, um, over-the-counter meds, hygiene and toiletry items, quilts, which, my, um, which we donated from my facility, uh, education assistance, high school supplies, diapers, employment assistance, general information assistance, paper goods, beddings, linens, welcome bags, uh, which were given to 75 Kingwood area families that were located in motels. Uh, shoes, toys, donation sites. I've already mentioned the uh, medical clinic. Um, they also had specialty doctors at the medical clinic at the church. Uh, so there were doctors that could pinpoint problems, say, with diabetes or hypertension or special specialty kind of areas that needed uh, people had um, problems with. And they also provided copies of everything that was done so that the people, as they found their own doctors, they could have a continuum of care. Also, the shelters opened up. Star of Hope, um, in their um, men's shelter, they housed one family of 42 people. And when the family first came, it was only like about 12 people, but they were looking for other family members. So Star of Hope got together and did what they could, and they located and brought together 42 members of this extended family, and they housed them in the men's shelter for over a month. Uh, also, the women and family shelter housed the overflow, people that were just had no place to go. Uh, one family that I know of housed 75 people in their house, and another family took in 21 family members from New Orleans. Uh, uh, Kingwood uh, United Methodist Church housed 150 evacuees. So. Um, we can see that the relief efforts were widespread. Um, volunteers uh, included 11 staff from an LA rescue mission, and they helped relieve the Star of Hope staff over several days. And Judy and her friend gave many counseling hours at the shelter sites in Houston. Money was also donated. Over $33,000 was given to various organizations like the Red Cross and uh, the United Way to disperse where it was needed most. Uh, one church uh, raised over $30,000, which they sent to another church in Vicksburg, Mississippi to help them rebuild. Uh, Faith Family Church in Victoria offered startup money to people to pay for rent, phone calls, gas cards, Walmart cards, furniture, and even a car. Uh, Lutheran Church uh, noted that they not only gave money and physical items, they cried with, they cried for the evacuees, they hugged them. Some still were wearing the clothes they had waded through the water in, and they offered encouragement and hope. And uh, that's something that we need to be very mindful of, that these people don't just need a house, they need understanding. They need compassion. They need to know for them that their spiritual needs are going to be met also. To be hit with the devastation of losing everything makes you bring 
everything in your existence into question, even your uh, religious beliefs. So they need those addressed as well as their spiritual and emotional and physical uh, needs. I wanted to read a few of the human interest stories that I received. And uh, they, these are just to touch your heart, to let you see uh, the impact on a one-to-one -one level that was seen after, uh, during the recovery phase. On the second day we were open, a lady came in from the shelter. She had been one of the Superdome evacuees. She needed a pair of shoes and a change of clothes, having nothing except the clothes she was wearing. I walked with her and asked her how she was doing. She said she would be fine if she could just find her baby girl. The baby had been with her brother and she had gotten separated from them and didn't know where they were or if they were even alive. I found her a brand new pink stuffed doll, gave it to her and told her to keep it so she had something to give her baby when they were reunited. And two days later, she found her daughter and she brought her over to our store carrying the pink stuffed doll. So those volunteers really felt it on a more personal level than just seeing it on television. Uh, there was also an RV that came from California, from Selma, California. They heard about the number of evacuees coming to Texas from Louisiana, and they wanted to help. And so they got in touch with their local radio station and their local newspaper and began collecting items to take with them to Texas. And in two days, they had connect, collected enough goods to fill a 34-foot RV they rented at a discount from their local RV dealer. And on Thursday morning after the hurricane at 12.30 in the morning, this family brought, uh, started moving toward Texas and they came to my area, Kingwood United Methodist Church, which was, which was a designated Red Cross shelter. Um, they arrived Sunday morning, and they also extended an offer to transport evacuees to either Colorado or back to their hometown of Selma, California. There was a church group in Victoria that um, also let me know uh, one story that uh, they shared with me. There was a couple that came to Victoria with a two-week-old baby. And they had been rescued off their roof and left on a bridge awaiting rescue in New Orleans after Katrina. Their two-week-old baby was reacting to the heat exhaustion and they were doing everything they could to keep her cool. They made it here a week after the hurricane hit and got medical attention as soon as possible. The baby seemed okay. Unfortunately, a week from last Saturday, the baby died. We attended to their physical needs, such as getting them an apartment, feeding and helping them with gas and other items. But this was a tragedy that couldn't be fixed by meeting physical needs. Our church family reached out to them and helped them with the funeral expenses, prayed with them, and did everything humanly possible to help them through this tragedy. We love them and will continue to extend a helping hand to them and to others as they start a new life here. And last, this was uh, one of the Methodist churches in Humble. Um, they were designated a Red Cross shelter at the last minute, uh, and they were housing 95 people. And the whole time that they had these people here, the Red Cross never showed up with anything. Um, so they opened up their storage, which is used for, for my ministry, the Interfaith Hospitality Network. And uh, they gave out whatever the people needed out of that storage. And there was a gentleman who was out on uh, Highway 59, which is a major thoroughfare in Houston. He found a family who just couldn't go any further and worked hard at talking them into coming into the church. But they didn't want to because they had a family member who was disabled and in a wheelchair. And they didn't want to go out in public. Finally, this gentleman got them to come to the church, and they put them in a classroom that they could use as their own as long as they needed it. The family, in return, helped with the chores, and they began to understand that the people in the church wanted nothing but the best for them, and they began to open up and trust them. And before the end of the five days at the shelter, they brought the handicapped family member down to join everyone for meals and companionship. And the church got together and replaced everything that was used 
over and above what was there before. And I thought that was just interesting that um, these are stories of people that, that needed help. And when these workers think back to Katrina and Rita, they're going to picture those faces. They're going to picture those experiences. And they're going to be able to use those in their ministries or in, in their work. Now, the question put before me in preparing for this, why did faith-based people respond? And why were they often the first and only responders. And a lot of times I know we think, having been in faith-based work for over 20 years, um, I know a lot of times people think, oh, you're only doing it for one reason. You just want to make me come into your religious beliefs. You just want to indoctrinate me and uh, just, you know, fill your churches. You know? And that's not the case. And it wasn't the case after the hurricanes. The reason faith-based people responded was because there were overwhelming human needs that had to be addressed. And they did that. Um, Holy Comforter Lutheran Church heard comments from evacuees such as, I couldn't have made it through this without church people like you. Or, I can't believe people care that much about us. Or, I can tell you really feel my pain. Another uh, person said, it's almost like you feel homeless with me. And someone else said, God bless you for what you are doing. Now, I don't want to get across the, the, uh, the thought that this is not the response you might get if you're not in a, a faith-based organization. It's just that um, I think um, these people responded because these people were in a faith-based organization. Um, this church's volunteers felt that many of the evacuees found the peace of the Lord in our gym. Among the racks of clothes and tables of food, we were the hands and feet of God in the world. Uh, the uh, pastor's wife from uh, Victoria said, The people of Katrina and Rita have more than physical needs, but emotional and spiritual needs that should be addressed as well. Um, the director of development for Star of Hope, Kathy Tabor, shared with me that most people hired at faith-based charities feel called. So it's not just a job. They invest themselves. They work longer hours when needed. They go the extra mile for those they are serving. The folks who stayed at Women and Family the night of Rita talked about the absolute peace they had in the shelter. They had prayed together, sung hymns together, and were just trusting God to protect them. Now, within all organizations, there are exceptions, but most of whom I have worked with or known serve unselfishly. Those that are not called don't last very long. Also, when you think about the response to Katrina in Houston, it was the churches and the faith-based organizations that stepped up and reached out. Churches all over and around Houston were housing, feeding, clothing, collecting furniture and delivering it, getting medical care, and the list goes on and on and on. This was done by Christians who were not being paid, but who are serving those in need. And just maybe we are different because faith-based organizations believe in miracles. When that homeless person comes in smelly, belligerent, and addicted, we can see the change that God can make because we have seen him do it over and over again. There's a friend of mine named Connie Poon, who's a member of Grace Community Church, the church that set up the medical clinic. And I think she summarized uh, the faith-based response very well. She said, no service was offered for evangelism purposes. The church distributed the church's business card, which told worship service information. And if people needed to talk to a counselor, they were referred to a Christian counselor. But she also said, it is our calling to feed the hungry and respond to the needs of people, whether they decide to follow God or not. It is God's job to draw people to him, but it's our job to serve. Thank you. I want to thank Tian for inviting me to speak here today. It really is an honor and a privilege to talk to you about the wonderful work and the gift of being able to go to Houston and work with the people down there. And so these are some of my reflections. I read this, I prepared this when I spoke at my synagogue in September, uh, a week after I returned. And I feel that there is a universal message in 
the work that is being done, as you said. It's not just about evangelism, but it's about the universal need to help other people. And so I'd like to speak about that and my spiritual belief. Um, I wanted to start out with a quote. I have come into deep waters and the flood sweeps over me. I'm weary of crying. Rescue me from the mire and do not let me sink. That's from Psalm 69. And that was the cover of the Jewish Journal the week of September 9th that had great coverage for what was going on for all the relief efforts, faith-based and otherwise or lack thereof, and why in particular groups like, like the ones that Gilda has just spoken about have gone in, the first responders, because they are always prepared. This is not just something they do because a Katrina or a Rita happened, but because there is always a need every day in this world to, respond, to reply to people. So indulge me here. Little did I know on that early morning of August 25th at 2 a.m., that was the night that I, fought, I taught my first field lab and integrative seminar. So at that exact moment, the impending power and force of Katrina and her ensuing havoc would begin a month of reflection, contemplation, and little did I know, a trip to Houston. Hearing the phone ring at that hour is unnerving, especially when I heard David's voice. This call from my soon-to-be 27-year-old son was urgent to him about his plane reservation that morning to attend the weekend's MTV Awards in Miami. Given the weather, the now imminent disrupt disruption to his travel plans for the big event were being changed, turned out to be at very, that very moment an unknown catalytic moment for me. It would trigger the subsequent two-week personal struggle the spiritual depletion and the questioning how to address social, political, racial, economic class and the human condition. Little did I know there was going to be a launching of this inner journey of evaluation, soul searching and rethinking. What are my priorities and what really needs to be done? I was to have taken my son to the airport that morning, but with the advent of the big storm, planes would not be taking off from LAX as scheduled and booked. Yes, Katrina was only beginning to make her unrelenting strength felt even 3,000 miles away here in California for my son, this new Hollywood agent, his mother, and the rest of the world. It would mean an inconvenience for him to be departing from another airport and change plans to avoid the expected storm early on it's in, in its anticipated pounding might. The brute force was at the beginning of its inexorable command over the whole southeast portion of this country. Miami did weather its initial but minimal Katrina touchdown. The MTVs went on with perhaps its fewer than expected number of attendees who opted not to go because of their planes being canceled and they couldn't reschedule the flights. The weekend had its own mini drama for my son because Suge Knight was shot at the death row record party. And yes, my son survived it but didn't make it home. The following night he called me with a different view of Katrina, not his personal disruption, but what this mayhem and havoc was all about. With bewilderment and sadness, he expressed his disbelief as he watched TV. The real inconvenience of the devastation and the tragedy the hurricane created for the residents of Mississippi, Louisiana, and the affected Gulf region. He being a new millennial, like perhaps some of you, filtering the world through CNN, and I the baby boomer, and I am 59 years old today, uh, with my reliance on radio, NPR for worldviews, and updates informing me of the misfortune unfolding. No visual pictures or sound bites for me up to this point, just the reporting and analysis I absorbed by listening to the radio. Many friends called to tell me to watch the news, something I was not doing in the first two weeks of the semester as probably many of you were not either. The priorities of teaching and running a satellite campus. To many others, things to do would be to watch TV, but for me, I wasn't able to do that. So radio informed me, and I thought assuaged the personal imperative to witness the inescapable situation unfolding, the helplessness we all felt. Many people called, watch TV, and so many students in my class, stunned by the helplessness of the disaster, said the same thing. They, like you, all of you who had started social work school, 
wishing to be social workers, the so-called helping profession, trying to make sense of the pictures and future they might be called upon to provide in such a scenario. Thus, I could not hold out, and I turned on my TV. And so began my witnessing, along with the rest of you, of the world, just what the crisis of weather can create with its fury, but then coupled with the underlying root causes that made this experience so much more extensive, devastating than it needed to be. The poli indulge me at this point. The politics of this nation, the priorities of this government, with its indecent neglect and lack of humane, equitable, and prescribed social, economic, and safety policies and structures, catapulted a region and our very own citizens into homelessness, drowning in the swirling waters filled with litter and garbage and sacred remnants of shattered and lost lives. Our country and the entire world viewing this apocalyptic drama and ensuing shameful nightmare before our very own eyes. We who thought this only happened in other countries and continents and hemispheres could not turn off the profound evidence of racial and class division and the resulting victimization that began as a weather issue and resulted in laying bare bones the social tensions of this country. Was it a coincidence that this night for me in fact coincided with the beginning of the Jewish month Elul, always in the fall, the month of preparation for the high holidays? Uh, these are the holy days in the Jewish religion that would begin a month later. In the month leading up to what we Jews call the days of awe, we are asked to reflect and engage in personal introspection, spiritual preparation for that which we are about to undertake during the high holidays. Part of this is the inventory that we call the cheshbon hanefesh, the accounting of the soul, seeking forgiveness from others, planning our new year with perhaps an attempt to draw closer to the divine. It is a time when we may even step back and with good intentions and consider ways to improve ourselves in the world. Traditions and texts teach us that it is during these 40 days that uh, up until Yom Kippur, the holiest day, the Day of Atonement, God is accessible, awaiting us to approach and seek our renewed commitments. This month is also the time when the ram's horn, the shofar, is blown every weekday in probably more religious families. It is its daily notes, it is said to remind us of the word teshuva, return, turning, repentance, turning to new ways, ethical, ethical and moral behaviors. The sound hearkens us, and the supposed saying is, awake all of you who are asleep, search your ways and mend them in teshuva, in returning. In the wake of Katrina, I had to ask myself, how asleep was I and others, and how have we been over the years? Perhaps thinking and wishing and believing, denying the great divide in this country. It's not really there. Or is it as discordant and profound a gap as we witnessed in the abandoned, frightened, aloneness of those clinging to rooftops, losing sight, or the grip of family members, are wading through excrement and horror at the Superdome. I sense my, my helplessness as a witness to these horrifying images. What work needs to be done to raise the awareness and warning of underlying lack of plans, provisions, policies, structures, analogous to the inherent risks that we face here with our geological faults, with its equally injurious destructiveness as we know the San Andreas to be? Yes, the time of this month of, of preparation of our soul, uh, the high holidays, its arrival coincided with my launching my educational experience with many of the students here and who wanted recipes for responsiveness, formulas for hopefulness, and healing interventions. And Hurricane Katrina triggered my own vulnerability, outrage, shame, despondency, spiritual and emotional depletion, and really push me to respond. My religious and professional credos are not dissimilar at all. Being Jewish and being a social worker really do promote the same values and approach. Employ a strengths perspective, perform ethically, provide charity, work for justice, balance life with spiritual health and well-being. 
Those very educational texts I would use with any student teaching the future social work professionals reflect the core precepts of my faith and the sacred texts such as Micah and his words, how we give charity, how we do social justice, the prophet Jeremiah and his message of how we care for the needy, the Perke Avot, the ethics of our fathers and mothers, and of course, the five books of the Old Testament, which we study the Torah portion, a jewel every week gleaning uh, the words that send us messages how to provide the commandments, how we live and care for one another in this world. It was up to me to repair from within and join in the repair of the world. The repair designed to give hope is an ever-present possibility for all of us. I decided not to shut off the television, but to take those images and move forth. And so we're, what were my options to make a difference? I had already called and pledged my money. That is certainly one form of giving. What else was there to tap into to really connect? I spent almost a week trying to secure leads, signing up with Health and Human Services and the Red Cross. It was gratifying to know that 30 to 50,000 others had volunteered and were ready to go. But the process was too slow, going to take too long for me at that moment. My office mate, Sheila Honig, and I decided to take the lead, and through good luck, the internet, and unending calls and emails, two weeks, um, I'm sorry, when I wrote this, I, a week later, I was able to find uh, secured work with uh, definite details, and a flight was booked to Houston to begin this repair. Six hours later, after we booked the tickets, we were on the plane. Uh, jetting off to Houston, I wondered what would transpire because I had five days. I had to get back and run the skirball. What would I do and how would I feel? How would I be changed? And what would the experience be like when it was over? I did have hope. I knew I had my credentials, my professional license, my California driver's license, a copy of my malpractice insurance. You always have to take that wish with you. And most of all, the desire to be part of something larger, to show care, to act kindly, to be available, and whatever it was that my assigned venues would request me to do, how to be responsive to the evacuees. This is not a new mandate to me and my work or the work that all of you will be doing, but the enormity of the 8,000 people at the Astrodome and the 5,000 people at the George Brown Convention Center and thousands more uprooted and dispersed in the process of transplantation and relocation. This was a 21st century diaspora. It was daunting. What would I see? What would I hear? What could I possibly do? I learned very quickly that after the processing of my credentials, the work was there and it was all around me, waiting to be done. For five days, I had the honor and privilege to work with the most magnificent people there. I refer to two groups in particular, those Texans, yes, those Texans, the ever gracious, benevolent folks of Houston and their impeccable service of delivering goods and services, care and consolation, hope and possibility to those who had suffered and were now in this new city of theirs. They who had experienced so many traumas, endured loss on every level one can imagine and survived the horrors, not only the storm, but the undeniable nightmarish journey from wherever their original home was to here. To be part of that professional team and volunteer unit provided the foundation or structure in this opportunity for responsiveness and care, and it was profound. I learned and I experienced the best of what can be when there's a collective unity, selfless efforts, indefatigable people, who want to make a difference through a delineated process of meeting needs with a genuine spirit of serving and being in service. This much in volumes more did we owe these folks who had indeed survived and we needed to provide all that we could to such a vulnerable group of people. As I walked into the Astrodome, the enormity of the structure took my breath away. Now I had never been in a dome of any sort before. The bones of the building were so evident in its architecture, and it was disarming. And I've never been there in the dome, as I said, but to see this space filled with thousands of people on their canvas cots trying to de manage displacement of their lives was something I will never forget. It was evident that they were reeling from their losses and the dehumanizing experience many of them 
had, uh, had on this journey. I was struck by the order and the cleanliness of the cavernous space. Yes, it's exactly how you saw it on TV. What was often not projected into the stories you heard of the specials that were aired was the tenor of these miraculous survivors and they, how they approached the moment in their journey of healing, reconstitution, reconciliation of such horrific events. As a social worker, you are always taught to begin with your connection with an open-ended question, something that will elicit the response indicating that the person can make or take that moment to a place of safety on their own volition. I felt the need to do this with all of these people at this moment who had so little power and control over their lives and the experience of recent days. Equally, they were often unable to utter or envision a future beyond the dim lights and the lack of privacy in this space. I listened to the fear of the unknown, bewilderment of what had happened, feelings of abandonment, and the trials and tribulations of just getting out alive. They expressed their profound grief from their multiple losses of kin, of home, friends, pets, jobs, possessions, and being in Louisiana. They needed to be heard, soothed, comforted, contained, and understood. I can only hope that I provided some of that human connection that affirms, responds, and listens to the tales of unmentionable experiences that no one should have to endure. For two days, I worked at the Astrodome, case finding, just going up to folks who appeared agitated, despairing, withdrawn, isolated, and bereft. Each person, every family, had a story to tell. Over five days, I worked with a multitude of individuals, both adults and children, and family units. I met a 70-year-old woman sitting isolated in her wheelchair on the floor of the Astrodome, using crayons to fill in a shape in a coloring book. She told me of her depleting journey, feeling stripped of her life, dehumanized and overwhelmed. At one point in our conversation, she leaned over and she said to me, I finally understand the Holocaust and what a concentration camp is. I've just lived that experience myself. One family of 26 at the convention center in a high-risk family area was assigned to me. There I met many of them two days in a row to deal with those within this close-knit family at highest risk. How to manage their emotional needs and assist them in helping to find five apartments to house them as close as possible together. They all cared for a 22-year-old nephew, a young man with severe cerebral palsy who could not see, hear, and could not eat, but was nourished through a stomach feeding tube, unable to manage anything on his own. All were loving caregivers for his entire life, and they saw him to safety. They calmly said their intention was to leave the convention center as they had entered it earlier days before, all together. They needed to know that they would be living in close proximity to share in the care of Julian as they began this new chapter of their lives, all together as they had always been. One cousin, Barry Jr., also 22, could not stop thinking about how he was going to die. He just wanted to talk and talk and find assurance and hope that he would be okay. He asked me if I would be telling these stories when I returned so that people would understood what really happened. A colleague's mother, the kind and gracious Gilda Taylor on this panel with me, oversees the Coalition of Interfaith Homeless Services in Houston. The work of these faith-based organizations stepped up to the challenge in a most magnificent way. Though their, through their network, I was linked up to a Methodist church in suburban Houston. The profound system of care, concern, and generosity I saw was beyond belief. It was great to have the chance to be in the big venues and then to see what can be done on a smaller basis. Assigned providing crisis mental health uh, counseling there was a great opportunity. Linking up to her led me to, this, to my work with one particularly tightly knit family of 21. And as you've heard, we're talking about these families that made it there together. They were housed at this suburban uh, Kingwood Church, which converted its buildings to house 125 homeless people from New Orleans. 
I applaud the almost 60 church members that I saw there myself that morning who served at every level with loving response and helped to reestablish lives for the evacuees in this house of worship. The matriarch of the 21 family group I met with said she was told she would need family to develop with the trauma of what it was like to be in the Superdome. She in fact said to me it was more likely she would need therapy to deal with the separation she was experiencing moving into her own place and missing the love of the people of the church who so lovingly cared for her and the families through their difficult relocation. She was just not quite le ready to leave the loving embrace of this church and the safety of its sheltered. Each person, each family reflected their compelling narrative and they entrusted that to me. And I possessed and was, and was so struck by these reiterated themes of loss, despair, appreciation, thanks, possibilities, and hope. What I want you to know is that every person I met express profound gratitude to me and all of those who provided the care and generosity of what they experienced in Houston. These incredibly weary but extraordinarily kind and loving people would always note the strength of their days was twofold. A sense of strong family bond coming through as they would as kin to be there through thick and thin, an unwavering refrain. They made it here together and they would survive together and they would begin again together. Their loyalty and commitment to family was irrefutable. The other strength that helped them to endure was their unwavering faith and belief in God, sustainer of their spirit and unconditional trust in that they will prevail with divine support and love. The words of faith and devotion were never preachy nor religiosity, but rather the utmost firmness and simplicity that really affirms life, the process of healing and the will to survive. Their words coming from each and every one who had suffered so much were incredibly therapeutic and uplifting for me and all of those in service. This rare opportunity I had through the misfortune of others to see the essence of survivorship rooted in belief the love and ties of family and those around you, the power of working together coupled with belief from above renewed things in them and in me. Hope. Each hour a story of survival, sheer survival and will, strength and power and spirit. The repair and replenishment of my spirit was tied up in what I was doing and working with them. The experience of giving only results in receiving that which is so needed. How true this was of the days in Houston. Yes, I was fortunate enough to go to Houston. I was given the opportunity to participate in something meaningful and unforgettable. The work continues for me and for all of us here in our cities that will directly impact on recovery of the evacuees and create stop gaps, uh, heaven forbid, future disasters there are local opportunities for each and every one of us in very small or grand ways to make a difference. It is our sustained commitment that we make. That is the mandate for one and all. But it is incumbent upon all of us to carry the work. Repair must be continued by us. <clears throat> there is so much more work to do through social justice, which necessitate us to be in roles, to be committed, to be connected and something that will ameliorate the gap and the divide. We must respond now to the need and not let the visible images of impoverishment, neglect, and abandonment ever happen again. We must be vigilant in our intentions and the vows and promises we make throughout the year to one another, and this must endure. Next year, when I come up to my month of spiritual reckoning again before the new year, I don't want to have to ask forgiveness for that which I abandon or let fade or become indifferent to that after the crisis has passed. When the acts of social justice are performed, a different form of charity can be given. Often our gifts are reactive to the drama and the mayhem. Making a promise to do good deeds through renewed commitment to all is in fact an affirming act to the divine, the divine in each of us and every human being. Through the many forms of charity, working, with, working for righteousness can achieve spiritual health and well-being, whatever our belief systems are, and make the world a better place. The direct connection between the two is about repair, that of our own, 
in the world in which we live. I want to wish all of you a happy Thanksgiving. And this is really a day where we say that we're thankful for our ability to give and the opportunities that we have, not just by whatever our faith is, but certainly by what our professional goals are. And so I wish you a happy holiday. Thank you. What we're going to do now is uh, allow us the opportunity to really reflect and to talk about what Gilda and Judith were talking about in regards to faith-based services. Perhaps we have questions in regards to misconceptions that we have regarding faith-based. What does it mean to assess a client in the very beginning and to talk about the concept of their religion, their spirituality, their worldview? Um, I think to start off with, one of the things that both Gilda and Judith were talking about was really that virtue and that concept of hope. Uh, George Bernanos, the French writer uh, who wrote uh, Diary of a Catholic Priest, said, the greatest sin is the sin against hope. That's the greatest sin alive. That sense that if we take away hope in our micro practice, in our macro practice, Really, we've taken away the very foundation of what it means to continue on the next day and the day after. And I think that's sort of one of the real sort of gifts that faith has is that it really impels many of our clients to hope again and again and again. That in that uh, clip that we saw of... Uh, of, of Oprah, uh, one of the women saying, we need ministers, we need ministers. And really the subtext of that is, we need hope. We need hope. That I think is really what, what was the subtext of that. And so what Tiana and I were talking about was how can we transfer a lot of what we are hearing here, transfer it to our day-to-day -day practice within social work. And so, you know, I think this is now an opportunity for, for comments for questions, for reflections, or perhaps alternate speeches, to really reflect about what it means to work within a community that is filled with faith, and how do we go about utilizing that as a catalyst for growth and for development of our clients and also of our communities. So I really want to leave it as much open as possible in regards to reflections and things of that sort, okay? So, anybody, please. Yeah? I think Raphael raises something that's very important. All of us, I think, first and second and students here. I mean, I think that we need to learn to look at a person in their social environment. And we look at all the pieces, the pie, the person and environment, all the systems that are at play, and we can never leave out what faith, spiritual path, religion plays a part in each individual's life to a greater or lesser degree. How we choose to use that is another thing that we decide individually. But I think when we do an assessment of an individual, we really need to know what their faith is, what their belief system is about, because it informs us, it informs our practice. When I was uh, at at the Kingwood Methodist Church that day, it, here I am, Sheila and I are walking around, licensed clinical social workers, and uh, a man found out that his grandfather had perished in New Orleans, and he wasn't the one that, uh, we weren't the ones that he wanted to see. He wanted to be with the people of the church. And you know, I saw the comfort and care that they provided him, and it's what he wanted and what he needed. And who was I as some licensed clinical social worker to be the one? Had he not had anyone else, I certainly would have been able to be there in some way. But I think that people tapping into their communities to work collaboratively together is really a very important thing. None of it is done individually, but rather that we all create a network of service along that continuum to work together. 
That is um, <clears throat> one thing that um, is very unique about where I'm working now. I used to be at Star of Hope, which was is, like I said, one of the main homeless shelters in Houston. And now I've moved to a very small two-person office, um, but it's a network. We have 10 churches uh, that house the homeless. Uh, they actually provide space in their church buildings to house our families. We take up to three families at any given time. And uh, they, we also have three support churches that will provide like food or volunteers or assistance in any way that they can provide it. The unique aspect is we have Lutherans, we have Episcopalians, we have uh, Presbyterians, we have Catholics, we have, we have a Church of the Latter-day Saints that's part of our network, and we're all working together. It's not a matter of, well, my faith is better than your faith, or uh, we can't work together because we really don't believe the same things. It's a matter of there is a need, and we're going to work together to fill that need. Now, while they're in the churches, the people are welcome to join in the services if they want to, but it's not required. They don't have to participate in any, any programs that the churches are providing. They're always invited, but it's up to them. And the thing that that really came home to me when I took over this job in August was that you really can work together. Even if you have basic religious differences, um, you can work together. We have another church we have is the Church of Christ. Uh, we're all working together. These are wonderful people that are all serving in the capacity to help those in need. And um, what I've seen on a macro level is that uh, nonprofit, faith-based organizations are businesses. They have to run as businesses, even if they are faith-based. So they have to be involved in secular community activities. You have to network uh, to get hooked up with different agencies. And this is what caused the faith-based organizations, I think, to be able to be first responders because they're used to stepping forward and working within the groups and calling on the people they already have set up networks with. Uh, we're not a strange group over there in the corner somewhere or doing our own thing. We are involved in the main society uh, the social, economic, political levels of society. And we are doing it maybe from a different aspect, but as part of the mainstream of society. And I think we bring a unique aspect in that we bring that hope and encouragement on a personal level every day uh, so that when it comes to answering and responding to to uh, disasters such as Katrina and Rita is something that we can respond at, at different levels that others couldn't. She has a question. United Way set up a network where um, they collected the money and then it was uh, doled out to uh, specific agencies that were designated like the Red Cross shelters and uh, different agencies that were set up to deal with the evacuation effort. Um, agencies that helped could apply to FEMA for funding. But we did not get, like, we did not get direct funds from the United Way or from FEMA or from the Red Cross. Um, that was all, you had to apply for that. And most of that money went toward the people. The United Way sent it to the organizations that were dealing with the issues. And, um, like, if my organization had housed people or done something like that, we could apply to FEMA for funding just like everybody else. Well, one of the things that I just wanted to say as, as a result of what Judith was saying in regards to integrating um, 
the spiritual and the religious within our psychosocial assessments. And sometimes we feel very uncomfortable saying, you know, what is your faith? Because what that question may imply to your client is, oh, I'm supposed to be of a certain faith, or if I'm not, I'm less than. And so opening up the question to what is it that gives you hope? What is your worldview? Um, you know, these sort of very generalized questions can sometimes begin to really filter what it is that really deeply gives them hope. What is their worldview? You know, I am an Orthodox Jew. Um, and I go to synagogue every Saturday, and that is really, so, ah, so now you have sort of a segue of which to follow, but starting from the very general, and then start going into the specifics depending on their answer, um, I think is, is really helpful, but very broad, and then becoming very specific. Questions, other questions? Yeah, yeah. I have a comment. Um, I was just going to say, at least related to what you said about hope, and then also relating it to the Katrina effort, you know, from my faith perspective, a lot of times I hear with the situation with such as Katrina, or just you can actually, like, broaden it to suffering in general, but um, in a particular scripture it says, you know, I will never give you anything more than you can't handle. And then I that in my work with people and just in different suffering types of situations, that loss of hope, it's like that a lot of times I think as social workers, we're going to be dealing with people who have hit the place in their life where they feel like they can't handle it. And so I think that's where the strength-based perspective comes in. It's finding the inner resources within them that they are strong and they can do it, but also providing the outer resources and allowing them to tap into those strengths. And so I think it's very important to know where they are getting their hope and where where does their strength lie as far as their faith belief or their family belief. And so I just think that's a very interesting topic, just uh, a particular verse that I've heard. So thank you. Thank you. Notice any differences in faith based organizations versus secular organizations? For two years, I worked at um, Black United Methodist Church in San Francisco, and they're, um, also, they also run a nonprofit organization, Clyde Foundation, and I interned there. Um, they had um, recovery programs, they had a medical facility on the fourth floor, they had low income housing, um, they provided three meals a day, seven days a week, and everything was done under this um, this guidance of unconditional love. Whether the people there decided to come to church on Sunday or whether they didn't, at the, the crux of it was you serve. You serve your fellow men. You walk with them. You don't do for them. You listen. You lend a helping hand. And that was a very liberating experience for me. It was because of that experience that I, was, that I decided to pursue my master's in social work because I felt that you don't um, do things for the client, you do things with the client. And that's a very, to me, spiritual, it has a very spiritual connotation because in my faith, it's been, in, I believe, in, in, in Jesus Christ, um, he walks with people. You know, you walk with him. And, um, and, and even though um, in the future I'll try to inform policy on a macro level, I need to know what's going on on a grassroots level. You have to be there. Watching things on TV, it's, it's not going to inform you. So I saw people at the church standing out on Ellis Avenue, um, ushering people in, asking them if they need clothing, and that that is social work. I think they're entangled, the two things. You had mentioned, well, I just wanted to make a comment. Um, I think that the from Baton Rouge in New Orleans, and after the storm, I, my husband and I couldn't stand another day of wringing our hands and crying in front of CNN. And he's from Mississippi, and he said, if you don't go on, they go. And so with the blessing of my professors, I was able to go back for two weeks and work <coughs> at many different levels, and I could talk for days about that. But what so many stories moved me and, and infuriated me and motivated me to do something about it and frightened me, because frankly, as someone who's on a major fault line, 
I could not stop thinking my entire time there. I've always trusted my government to be there for me. I've got my three days of hurricanes, or sorry, <clears throat> earthquake supplies in the garage. Well, that's not going to be enough, clearly. Um, and, and one of the things that I have been thinking about and reflecting on since this happened is the extraordinary effort of the faith-based groups. In ba I went to Baton Rouge um, because I was able to get in there easily and just dive in and start working. And we can think in Los Angeles, we can really learn from that and somehow harness the energy, mobilize the resources that we already have, have something in place for when it does happen. And that's just something I wanted to plant a seed to everyone here that's budding social workers. Um, it's an extraordinary resource that, that we would be well advised to to plan for the future. While, you know, while FEMA was stumbling all over themselves, uh, like the Keystone Cops, the churches were popping up shelters every hour, you know, taking people in off the streets when it was clear that this was not going to be a short term thing. And actually, that has happened um, in Houston. Um, organizations are looking at their disaster plans, their emergency response systems. Uh, in UMBO, we have gotten together an interagency council, and there are just every agency conceivable in UMBO is meeting and trying to come up with a disaster response plan so that the next time we can do it better and we can be more ready. But I think that's something that I'm seeing a lot more of throughout the area in Texas is planning. What do we do next? You know, I went to a meeting where the school districts were talking about how they responded. And one of the things every single one of the districts has done is go back and reformulate their emergency response plan. So that's a good thing that came out of this, is now we see where the def deficiencies are. Let's fix those and let's look to what we can do better. So that's a positive thing. I'm very glad that happened. as they went, you know, the officials in the school system dealing with mental health issues, kids K through 12, thousands of kids coming in that they weren't expecting. Hopefully they don't have to do that again. But, you know, they, they have this program policy in place that can translate across the world. I'd like to make a comment. I think I agree with everything that Far. And I think what we have to do is continue the momentum on a micro and macro level. Mm -hmm. How we plan to meet the needs of people and how the service delivery system needs to always be in place, not just reactive, but very proactive. And I think the other piece is for all of us who do macro work as well, and that's something that all social workers should be doing, we need to look at the infrastructure and why our government lacked the kind of response that it did. You know, why there are Michael Browns in positions that they are and what happened, you know, working for an equestrian team does not prepare you to head uh, an agency to react in the way uh, that it, that it happened in New Orleans. I mean, we all witnessed that. It was going to be awful, but it didn't have to be the way that it was. And I think we need to recognize that. What do we need to do every day in our lives? You know, is it just serving the needs of people on an emotional, spiritual, psychological level? Or how do we take a political stand and, and change things economically, how we look at the, the divide in terms of racial and class kinds of issues. These things are everywhere. We feel it everywhere in the world. Driving, where we live, what goes on. What should be given to people by their government? What can they expect versus that which isn't in place? And then we have wonderful agencies responding. I had. Uh, taken down something from the internet, you know, it's like having the world's best library in your computer. And what's uniquely effective about faith-based disaster responses is, is it infuses hope in the relief efforts. And that was certainly something that we saw. It drops demeaning demarcations between responders and survivors. Because until we all believe that we are only all one step away 
from being an evacuee and a disaster survivor. We're all clients all of the time. We all have issues. We're no different than the people that we work with. But we may not have had our house flooded or destroyed by a 7.1 earthquake. We need to like not pay attention to so much to the sound bites of the TV and, and what we're looking at there. We need to really investigate ourselves, be involved in the community. We need to, um, we need to transfer our expertise, as Gilda was saying, how across faith lines and across state lines. We need to plan ahead. I know uh, Mayor Villaraigosa has gone to the mayor of Phoenix to talk about plans, you know, heaven forbid anything should happen here like an earthquake. That would be the nearest city. It's sort of, I think, about the same distance. What is Houston and New Orleans? A couple hundred miles? Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. Where would people go if we were in some kind of situation to the largest city? What the absorption might be? And, you know, what we need to do for ourselves, how we plan every day and how, how we live. We have to really instill that kind of hope in one another and working together. And I think that's what I learned about the collective efforts, whether it's in a faith-based way or working in grassroots kind of way that has no connection. The message is really universal about working to help one another. of organizations as examples of what the government can do. And um, I know that, the, I mean, the church that I belong to, they don't only teach us to have, you know, a day supply of emergency, but a year, a year supply. And um, we have canneries where we can go and do all these things and do it for minimal um, cost on our part. And there are warehouses all over the country just filled with food waiting for, you know, disasters to happen, basically. And also, just they're great places to educate. I think if, if we think about all the people who who attend these churches or uh, you know faith-based organizations, what have you, um, we could reach pretty much the entire country. I mean, everybody, almost everybody, believes in something. You know, no matter what it is. And I think those are great places just to to educate people on ways to prepare themselves. And we can look at the united efforts that we've been talking about about these organizations and just look at that collaborative effort and the impact that it has. And those, I think, those are the examples that we need to show to our government and say, look, look what happens when we all work together, when we do this, it's possible. or anything from people? Any last words? Well, thank you all so very much for coming. We appreciate your taking time out of your one major break of the day <laughs> to spend with us and hopefully, you know, take, take food to go with you if there's anything left. Um, but we do thank you for coming and, and participating in the panel. Thank you. Thank you.